Good morning. And for everybody who is willing and able, if you would stand with me and read Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord, Lord will not will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Now let's continue in worship with Martin in the group. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you here. See my friend Todd over there. He's happy because all his football teams won yesterday. So I know his praise is going to be high. Woo! And all those people who are suffering this morning because their team lost, your praise needs to be high too. Celebrating in the storm. So here's a song we all know. Mm, you give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken great are you lord it's your breath it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise your breath in our lungs so we pour darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord it's your breath it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. Shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. The great are you, Lord. All the earth and all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. The great are you. Shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise. Your breath in our lungs. So we pour out. 
It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. Your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. And great are you, Lord. We remind ourselves this morning. Just reminding us that you're already here. But sometimes we don't realize because we're not here. From what is seen 
that I've come to be to know your love Father in me Father you're all I need my soul sufficiency and my strength
One of my favorite parts of the week is um, standing outside and just seeing people come to present themselves to, for God and, and toward each other and for worship. And um, every once in a while, you have this moment with someone where you kind of break through the sort of veneer, veneer is a good word, of just like, yeah, I'm good, I'm fine, I'm well. And um, had this amazing person this morning say, I'm just doing okay. And was like, do you want to keep it there? Is there is, how can I step into okay with you? And this person just revealed what's going on just underneath the surface. And I think um, we can have a church where we keep it like on the surface and it's sort of nice and everyone like looks good and we feel okay. But like, I think what we all know and what we want to cultivate is a, a culture of sincerity and authenticity where we all know, like, do you just scratch a little bit under that veneer and there's wounds and there's brokenness and there's worry and there's hardship. And, and it's just like, it's just life. And so this morning, let's just, let's just bring our life to this place. W- where is their worry? Where is their fear? Where is their brokenness? And what would it look like for you this morning to say, God, I'm, I'm tired and the burden is heavy and I, I want to believe you, not just to believe in you, but I want to believe you that, that the burden is light when I do this with you and with others. So Holy Spirit, would you just help us to, to be deep people, not complicated academic people, but deep people that are aware of our own emotions aware of our own feelings, aware of our own wounds and hurts and longings and dreams. And this morning, we just invite you into an area where we are tempted to do life on our own and feeling like we need to grind it out. And we, wanna, we just want to release that to you and your power and your presence. Would you come Would you give us the courage to invite you, creator, into that which worries us most right now? God, release power and faith. Release courage and joy. Where the enemy wants to steal our joy, we claim it in the name of Jesus. That you would make the church a joyful people that doesn't suppress hard things, but faces them with courage because the Spirit is with us. So impart joy and peace that transcends understanding. And we pray this prayer that Christians are playing all over the world and saying, most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We've not loved you with our whole hearts. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry. We humbly repent. Through your son, Jesus, have mercy on us. Forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your way to the glory of your name. Amen. Friends, may we walk in peace because Jesus imparts it to us. As we say every week, the peace of the Lord be with you. Just invite you to greet one another, exchange peace, and we'll call you right back. Friends, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. My name is AJ, and uh, Turner is on some, some family rest this week up in the mountains, and so I get to step into his big shoes here, just informing our community what's going on. And I'll just say, like, that game yesterday was exhausting. 
I mean, anyone with me, you know, like, I'm going to, I kid you not, by the time the 18th inning came around, it was, no, it's not what I'm um, But uh, truly, it, October is such a beautiful, special month in the low country. I mean, right? Am, am I right on that? I, I will say it's weird. Um, like, does anyone else feel like maybe your I- neighborhoods are a little over-identified with Halloween? Does anyone else feel that way? Like, like, it feels that way to me. Like, wow, this, this is a lot. This is like the new Christmas. But I will say, like, on my block, there's a guillotine. And, like, there's a guillotine on my block. And then on my block, there's also an a, a old man in a cage that lights up when you go. Like, this, this is a lot. This is a lot. And they have five-year-olds, twins, at their house. I'm like, five-year-olds. Like, it's just like, it's bananas. I like trick-or-treating, but what happened to, like, Casper the Friendly Ghost and Jack Lanterns? Like, this is another level of crazy. Yeah, Martin, take it down. Take it down. Take down your guillotine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we have a, a really incredible October coming up, though. Um, we have Focus coming up in a couple weeks. That's a few Saturdays from now, October 29. And I just have to say, like, this is a day. It's a Saturday. From 10 into the evening, there's a two to five break in between for stuff that you have to get done or rest or siestas if you're like me or like just hanging out with kids. But it's going to be um, a day where we're really focusing on the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, going deeper and deeper into intimacy with God and what flows from that. It's also a time where we're going to be spending a ton of time together in community that we just need time together and we want to be intentional about taking next steps. We've already got over 70 people locked in coming to this thing. But if you're not, we, we just, this is a part of saying, if you're available, come on board and be with us this day. Even if you can only make some of the sessions, that's okay. It's 20 bucks for everybody who is sort of an adult. Kids are free. And um, that includes all your food. And there's nothing else that you have to pay for other than that. Um, that being said, I want to invite Katie up because this isn't just a time for adults. We've also got vision for the formation of children on this day. So do you want to give us just a quick update as to what that looks like? Hi, Katie. Hey. Hi. Hey. Hey. Um, yeah, so we want to start off the weekend with family worship. So our kids will start off in here with y'all, um, and we're going to have a great time of just having our family worship together. Um, and then we're going to take the kids in the back, and we're going to do some fun things. We're going to teach them how to understand who the Holy Spirit is, which for kids, it can be very confusing to understand how there's three and one. Yeah, adults too. Spirit, I think that's right? not I mean, like all obvious. of us. Yeah, for sure. Right. So we're going to simplify it, and, um, and then we're going to do some fun experiments to explain that part. Um, and then we're also going to listen. Um, we're going to teach them how to listen to the Holy Spirit and how when they listen to the Holy Spirit, how that can impact their life and lead them to great things with their friends and in their life at school. Um, And then we're going to do some fun crafts. We're going to have great snacks. Um, We're going to do games, and we're going to have some obstacle courses. So the daytime is going to be really fun, and then at night we're going to come back. We're going to have a big movie night outside with a blow-up screen and popcorn bar. So bring your kids. It's going to be a great weekend, and um, it'll be a lot of fun for us. Thanks, Katie. Appreciate you so much. Um, So focus is coming up. Feel free to register so we know how to plan and order catering and all that stuff if you get a chance. Um, another thing is coming up this week, uh, busy week, men's fire pit. I'll be there on Thursday. Come join me and a few others just to hang out, get to know each other. Community matters. And I'll say this, like, there's also another women's event coming up on Friday night um, over at Margaret Merritt's house. Um, bring an appetizer to share for the women. Um, community, one of the things we're discerning is that it requires intention. And that community, we want to happen to us. But that there's a level of intention in stepping in and realizing, like, by Friday night or Thursday night, it's like, I just want to go home and watch Netflix. But it's pressing beyond that to say, the way community happens is that we show up. And everybody has a role to play in that. And when everyone shows up, it's just amazing the sparks that can happen. And so we really want it to be a place that shows up. So if you're available, we'd love to have you come out for that. Also, um, next Sunday evening is our biannual meeting. We're going to be talking about our budget and also some vision for the new year. And so if you are a member of this church and call this your home, um, we would love for you to join us on that. And even if you're sort of exploring, saying, I think this is my home, I'm not officially a member, come on. Like, we just want you to know what's going on underneath everything in our church to be um, transparent and also to be people that you feel like you're not just sort of the last one to know, but sort of um, dialed in and invited into who we are and where we're going as a people. Um, that being said, let's turn our hearts this morning to the readings of the teaching text. Do you have a microphone? If not, okay, let me, I'll, I'll set it up for you. So that I can hold it. You can hold it? Okay. She can hold it. She's Ashley. She's heroic. Go ahead. All right. 
Our first reading is from the second book of Kings, chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elijah, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elijah replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elijah saw him no more. Our second reading is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to all the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Our third reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, how will be your name? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, um, we're going to continue our conversation on um, the Apostles' Creed. Do I have my little remote thing? I don't think I do. Un momento. My slides are really complicated, so they let me do it these days um, in order to relieve the slide person. So, thank you. Um, Who can tell me what city this is? Bueller. Anyone? Anyone? It's hard to tell because um, this is Jerusalem. It's hard to tell because we usually recognize it because of this gold dome, right, called the Dome of the Rock, which is over where they think Abraham ascended, where Muhammad, as the the Muslims would say, ascended. And so ascension is like a a big part of this, right? Not not Abraham ascended, where where Isaac was, they have bound Isaac, but it's where Muhammad, they said, ascended um, at the Dome of the Rock here. And um, just for extra credit, there's Capers Bar. And, And so this past July, for three nights in a row, I sat on a balcony when we were in Jerusalem, and um, this was my view from our balcony. And it was just beautiful to just look out and to see the outskirts of Jerusalem. Sadly, the, the Dome of the Rock was nowhere in sight as the sort of iconic image that we usually, you usually have. But I want you to hang on to this image, and I want you to just kind of sear that into your mind, because I'm going to bring that back in a little bit. Today, and we're going to continue a conversation that we're having about the Apostles' Creed, which is sort of 18 lines that is the center of our faith. And out of that, it's, it's basically a way of saying, take all of the scriptures and put it in 18 lines and then carry it to the ends of the earth, because that is the sort of marrow of the Christian faith. It's not sort of tertiary issues and sort of debates on certain things. It's like these are the 18 lines that the original framers of the church said, make sure you, you don't lose this, because if you lose this, you lose everything. You lose power, you lose authority, you lose presence, you lose what binds you together as a people united across cultures across the world. And so today we hit this line, we're sort of now moving beyond the middle of the creed toward the back half of it. And it reads that he is ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. That he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And what I want to suggest this morning is this, and it's simple, but it's something that I think it deserves consideration. This one line might be the most empowering, least understood line of the entire creed. Like, I just want to suggest, like, this is one of those lines, like, 
What I mean by that is that most Christians don't spend a lot of time really meditating on the creed anyway. I didn't. And most Christians don't spend a lot of time meditating on the ascension of Jesus. I, I think, like, for the Christian, like, the ascension is kind of this, like, optional add-on to the cross and the resurrection. Like, we don't really ever get there to linger there. Like, we know a lot about the cross. We have certain days in the church where we really lean into that on Good Friday. We know a lot about the resurrection and the day in the church calendar that we really talk about is on Easter. Really big deal. But the ascension is kind of like a sidecar, right? And so, like, you know sidecars, right? They're sort of optional. They're sort of along for the ride. So, like, let's just say, like, Batman represents the cross and the resurrection, right? Like, he's the main event. But then sort of Robin, let's just say, is the ascension. Robin's the optional sidekick. By the way, any Adam West fans in the house? Two. Three. Right? I love the, like, loose costumes they used to. It's amazing, right? Does anyone know Robin's real name? Exactly. Nobody cares about Robin. Poor Robin, right? Like, he's a sidecar. And it feels like that as the resurrection, right? Or as the ascension. Like, I grew up not really thinking it was a really big deal. And then I started reading this Anglican theologian. His name's N.T. Wright. He's a historian. And he started, he wrote a whole book, basically, on the ascension called Surprised by Hope. And it really got me rethinking that maybe I've missed some things along the way. That, oh my goodness, maybe the ascension is massive to the story of God. And maybe this is why the writers of the creed actually included it in the 18 lines. That there's something about the ascension that if you miss the profundity of this, you're going to miss some things when it comes to knowing and really experiencing the fullness of the kingdom of God. Maybe there's a reason it's in there. So what I want to do is to pray. And then I want to explore why the ascension mattered then and why the ascension matters now. So let's pray together, and let's just invite the Holy Spirit. I don't know what kind of frame you're in, if you're exhausted, if you're energized, if you're excited about October, if you're really pumped because November's around the corner with Thanksgiving, you're like, oh man, Thanksgiving, that's sort of a downer for me. Whatever that is, every, everything in between, let's just invite the Spirit to meet us in this place. And that as we unpack the Scripture, that something new and fresh would happen where we didn't expect it this morning. We just thought we were coming to church, and all of a sudden, the Spirit meets us, and oh my goodness, there's, there's, that's helpful. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come, and we ask that we would come and meet you here, that our bodies are here, but would our souls arise, and wherever we feel stuck or frustrated or tired, or wherever we feel excited and longing and dreaming, I pray that you would flood this space. That as we sang earlier, that your breath would be in our lungs and we would be aware that you are in this place. And so we ask you to meet us through your text. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so he ascended and is seated. And, And I've taught before here the idea of rabbis that when they would give an authoritative teaching, they would sit in what's called the Moses seat. This is an old Moses seat. This is from the synagogue in Chorazin from the 4th century. And you can find it in the Israeli Museum in the center of Jerusalem. You can go actually see this thing. And if every synagogue would have a Moses seat. It was the idea that when the rabbi was giving an authoritative teaching, it wasn't why he was standing and walking around. It was that when he would sit. By the way, when I sit on a stool, I'm not doing this maneuver. Someone has asked me before, like, I notice you sit sometimes on a stool. Are you doing a Moses seat? No, this is just a stool. I'm not authoritative. The scripture's authoritative. The spirit is due. And I, we're, we're just talking about the text. That's what's happening here. So this is not authoritative when I sit. When the rabbis would sit, though, it was known as what was called authoritative. And so when you see that in the creed already, that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, there's something happening there that the original hearers of the text would have been cluing in on, picking up on. And that is why it's clear that Jesus says, according to Matthew, that when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and what? Hello? Did what? Why did he sit down? Because he wanted to say, I'm the new and better Moses you've been waiting for. I'm the one. I'm the king. Kings sit on thrones. 
Jesus is in a humble way on the Mount of Beatitudes, taking a seat, saying, what's about to come out of my mouth, you can take it as the word of God, because I am the Son, co-eternal, always existing with the Father, and I'm about to give you revelation. That's what's happening in here. So he is ascended, and he's seated in a kingly, authoritative posture that Jesus has authority and he reigns and he reigns from a greater realm called heaven. Heaven is not this place next to Neptune. Heaven is a dimensional realm where the kingdom of God fully is and wants to interlock it in time with earth. That is the reality of the biblical story. And so Jesus has authority and he reigns from a realm greater than our politicians today. He reigns from an authority greater than the power brokers on earth. But To best wrap our minds around the ascension of Jesus, we have to turn to a story that happened around 700 years before Jesus came and walked on the earth. In the Old Testament, what's happening is that God is constantly sort of like laying spiritual breadcrumbs that sort of draw his people. Oh, you saw this? You see these sort of like themes that get repeated over and over and over. And you'll see that in the text today. So as we read about this story from Elijah, Elisha, those are two different people, J-A-H-S-H-A. Elisha is the disciple of Elijah, right? Eli- they're both prophets. As we read this story, I want you to be hearing echoes of the ascension of Jesus 700 years before in the ascension of Elijah. 2 Kings 2. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven. Sound familiar? In a whirlwind, Elijah said to Elisha, his disciple, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives, as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now, You think about the chutzpah of this, the boldness, the grit, the determination. Elijah, the rabbi, the prophet, is saying to Elisha, you stay here, I got to go over here. And Elisha is saying, no, 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 I'm coming with you. The determination, the boldness, the grit. When I read this this week, I asked myself the question, could anyone accuse me this week of spiritually being bold and determined? Or am I passive in my faith? Am I bold? Do I step out? Do I take risk? Do I talk to that person? Do I sense the presence of God and move on it? Do I give there? Do I step in here? Do I care about my neighbors? Am I being active or am I passive? Verse 3, the company of the prophets of Bethel came out to Elisha, the disciple, and asked, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master Elijah from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, so be quiet. I love that. Verse 4, Then Elijah said to him, stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me now to Jericho. And as he, and he replied, as surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. And so they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets of Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master Elijah from you today? Yes, I know. Here he goes. So be quiet. Verse six, then Elisha said to him, stay here. The Lord has now sent me to Jordan. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. And so the two of them walked on. Three times you see this sort of recurring theme, I will not leave you. And what's happening is Elijah is testing the desire of Elisha. You say you want the kingdom. You say you want to walk into the realm and the reign of God. But do you really? Do you have the determination to do that? Or are you passive? Do you really want what you say you want? Or do you just kind of want to live your life and you hope that God happens to you along the way? And there's this sort of chutzpah, this sort of desire to move more deeply into God's kingdom. But you got to use your feet. And it's not about earning, it's about activating life. And here we go, verse 7. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went out and stood at a distance. And facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan... Elijah, he took this cloak and he rolled it and he struck the water with it and the water divided to the right and to the left and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. By the way, sound familiar? What breadcrumbs do we have earlier that help illumine this text? Where do we see that before? A couple places. What's that? Moses? Where else? Joshua. Joshua, I saw that mouth, Clayton. That was right. Joshua. We already see these recurring themes. It's as if God is constantly getting the future ready 
doing things in the present, that preparing the people of God in the future to say, whoa, whoa, we've seen this before. This is how our God works. And when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken to you. Okay, hang on to that miracle we just talked about. That's going to come back in a second. Now, let me show you a map. This is the pursuit of Elisha with Elijah over 50 miles. He keeps saying, no, 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 I'm going to keep going. And they're walking. They're not taking the tram. They are walking. So it requires effort for him to say, I want the kingdom of God. I'm coming with you. You are my rabbi. I want to see what you do. It gets even better. Yeah, I mean, maybe Elisha just wants to get his steps in on his Fitbit. But I think there's more happening here. There's something happening. And he says this. He says, this is what I want, Elijah. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Now, that's a weird thing to say because that's the sort of thing that sons expect from their fathers, a double portion of the inheritance, deeply rooted in the context. It's a father-son conversation. I want a double portion. Here's what he says. You've asked a difficult thing, Elijah. Yet, if you, if you what? Say it again. Hang on to that. If you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. Fast forward 700 years to Jesus. He's on the Mount of Olives. He's about to ascend to the Father. And here's what the text says in Acts, picking up on the breadcrumb. They were looking intently in the sky. What did Elijah say? If you see me when I go up into the sky, I will give you a double portion. And here you have the followers of Jesus, the disciples, seeing him all these years later. It's the same event. It's the new ascension. There is a connection here. Back to the Elisha story, and I'll close it here. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to the heavens in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this. He sees him, right? And cried out, my father, check that out. I mean, you hear already this double portion that he wants. And he is saying he sees them as a kind of father. And the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Exactly the story of the disciples. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. And he took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and he struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided right and left, and he crossed over. In other words, Elisha started to do the miracle work of Elijah. The son started doing the work of the father. Because after Elijah ascends into heaven, Elisha does this miracle. Elisha has been Elijah's disciple. Do you remember? When Jesus would say to disciples like you and me and the twelve, he said, the disciple is not above the rabbi. But everyone who is fully trained will know what their rabbi said, will know what their rabbi, um, will, will know like their rabbi. He didn't say that. He said everyone who is fully trained will be like their rabbi, will be like him. Do you remember when Jesus says, very truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing? Elisha, Elijah? but you will do even greater works than the works I'm doing. This is double portion language, y'all. What Jesus is talking about with you and me and with the disciples is double portion language. And why does he, he says this, because I go to the Father. Well, why does he bring the Father up here? Because through Jesus, we all become sons and daughters with double portion inheritance. And here's the thing. I don't think we know that. I don't think we realize that. I don't think we know the chips that are still on the table for us to play. We just walk around passively as if like, well, I'll go to heaven someday when I die. That's the goal. The Elijah's ascension story, it's preparing the people of God for the Jesus ascension story. And when Jesus ascends to heaven, the most important thing I think that can be said out of this text, when Jesus ascends into heaven and sits at the right, not a rabbi move, by the way, didn't do that. That's not authority. When Jesus ascends to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, here's the thing. It's not a break in the ministry of Jesus on earth. When Jesus ascends into heaven and sits at the Father, it's an advancement of the kingdom of heaven on earth. 
We think, great, Jesus is gone. When he comes back, then things are going to get cool again. That's not the biblical narrative. Jesus ascends to the Father. Why? Because when Jesus was in the flesh, he was located and reduced to place and time. And when he ascends to the Father and sends the Spirit inside of his people, it means that his glory can be spread and can be filling the entire earth. Do you understand that the ascension of Jesus isn't Jesus saying, I'm out, I'm going to come back someday so y'all look busy until I come. It's him saying, I'm out because I want to send the Spirit so that everywhere you go into all the world carries my glory and my presence and my power. The ascension of Jesus is God's plan to renew the world. It's a part of that entire story. And this is why you are called the body of Christ. Literally, God sees you as his body. In the absence of the physical Jesus, he has sent the Spirit to indwell you. That you are the body of Christ. Because everywhere we go, God's vision for us is that we would actually have his authority to be his hands and feet. I need to hear that every Sunday because I forget that by Monday at lunch. And y'all, this is what focus is about on October 29th. Living into your inheritance. Living into God's vision for your life and your work and your family and your neighbors in this community. Ascension means that Jesus is king, that the world belongs to him, and that he's empowering his people with authority, not to go to heaven when they die, but to bring heaven to earth while we live. That's the call of Jesus. You know, if you're cynical like me, if you're just rocking in here like, I don't know if I believe this stuff, this is kind of nutter. Here would be my question. Jesus is king. Are you kidding me? The world is a mess. And you want to say Jesus is king. If Jesus is king, how do you explain the headlines? If Jesus is king, how do you explain Putin? If Jesus is king, why do we have Hitler? It doesn't appear that Jesus is king. It doesn't appear that Jesus is king. Let's just be honest. Let's go back to Jerusalem. Close with this. My final night at this hotel. I was exhausted, you know, just being in it. You know, you're underslept. You're on a bus some of the day. You're hiking. You know, you, you can't get caught up with insomnia. You know what I'm talking about, Gabby. Like, and so I order room service this final night. And it's amazing. I love a good pizza. Hummus. Hummus. You know, look at this. I mean, this spread. So I invite my friend Jay up, and we sit on the balcony, and we're eating together, and we're just hanging out as brothers, and we're talking about what it means to follow Jesus in our marriages, what it means to follow Jesus all the days of our life, what that actually looks like. And I'm looking over the sunset in Jerusalem, and and something clicks. I'm sitting there. For the last three nights, I've been staring at this, and I'm like, wait a second. Like, that looks like a lot of limestone over there. That looks like tombs. Tombs that you would see on the Mount of Olives. And it slopes down. The problem is, like, where's the Dome of the Rock? So that can't be the Mount of Olives. And I'm sitting there just watching, and I'm like, oh my goodness. Jay, there's the Dome of the Rock. It's right there. It's been here this whole time. And I just haven't realized it. And this amazing thing clicks for me. The kingdom of God is here. I just don't realize it. But some people do. And they live differently. They act differently. They chase different stuff. They long for deeper things. They pray. They study the scripture. 
They seek justice. They give. It's because they know a secret about where the world is headed and who is really in charge, even when it doesn't look that way. And by the way, where did the ascension happen? Right there. It's been there the whole time. And I just didn't realize it. Listen, the church are the people who by faith believe and begin to live under the reign of King Jesus until it becomes obvious at his coming when every knee will bow and every tongue confess. What is that? What is knees bowing? It's bowing to the rightful king of creation who reigns over all. The question is not, where is Jesus king? The question really is this, where isn't ultimately Jesus already king? So I ask you to think about this. Is there any place in your life right now where he's just not king? See, see, Jesus doesn't force his reign on us in this time. He woos us into saying, you are Lord, you are better, you are good. I submit because you have better plans and your way is better than mine. And the question is, is there any place in your life where he isn't king today? Like, where have you determined to sit on the throne of your life? And here's the thing. You can do that. You're not going to get shamed today. I'm not going to guilt you into anything. I'll say this. His burden is light. And being on the throne of your own life is super heavy. To be the one that has to produce, that has to fix it all, that has to be in control. Jesus says, look, I have a better way for you. But you've got to learn to give it to me and trust that I'm really the king. Like, how would I know where that is? How would I know, AJ, where that is, where Jesus isn't king? Here's one word. Here's how you know. Worry. This morning, where you are most prone to worry, you are least prone to surrender. If you source your greatest worry you will find there the invitation to give it to him as king. And that's where freedom is found. That's where joy is discovered. That's where renewal takes place. Where isn't he king? Let's pray together. Lord, thanks for my friends. Thanks for your invitation to enthrone you in every aspect of our lives. So we pray that as we come to the creed this morning, that we come with full hearts that are just ready for more of you, God. So come and move, and as we come and take communion today, would we receive your kingdom, and would we lay down our own? Would you truly move in our hearts? In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as you are able? Let's proclaim this uh, Apostles' Creed, and uh, as we say it each week in this series, let it just continue to uh, go from head to heart, from lips to living, to something deeper maybe than we've ever considered before, and let the Lord speak through this to us, and let it be our story. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And so we proclaim, the Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And so we continue to tell the story 
that Paul told us of what Jesus did. He says, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given things, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, Holy Spirit, thank you for these gifts of your body and your blood that you have made us to be your body, Lord, in this world. You know we need it, and you know this world needs us to be your body. And so let us boldly live into this image that you have uh, given us, this identity you have invited us into. And so thank you, and use these gifts for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we proclaim this mystery of faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. I want to go ahead and invite our uh, servers forward, and as they come forward, uh, let's pray the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. This morning, come with expectation. Come with boldness. Don't be passive. Be active. Be ready. Be open. Amen. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, and to
refiner's fire. Refiner's fire. You want to stand with us? song for the congregation today is one that some of you may be familiar with already but it's pretty easy it's a little bit of a faith builder I believe happen and miracles happen when you move healing is coming in this room miracles happen when you move heaven is coming and miracles happen when you move healing is coming in this room miracles happen when you move heaven is coming 
Cause we need a move We need a move We need a move We need you to move oh. Yes, we invite you to move in our lives, Lord We believe that you can still move mountains. And we believe that you can still lose strongholds. We believe that you're the God of wonders. We believe that you're still able to raise the dead. That you can still slay those giants. here for you. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. We are here for you. Come and do what only you can do. Set our hearts on you. Come and do to move in our circumstances. Let our faith rise. Let our faith rise. Mm. Let's sing miracles happen. And miracles happen when you move. Healing is coming in this room. Miracles happen when you move. Heaven is coming. Miracles happen. And miracles happen when you move. Healing is coming in this room. Miracles happen when you move. Heaven is coming. Heaven is coming. Yes, we need you to move. We invite you to move. Friends, it's such a pleasure and honor to worship with you here today. I pray that we all can see God move this week and experience his wonders. Now let's go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.